So we are so happy to have all of you here. Uh, thank you. My name is Austin Terrell. I am the Adult Programs Coordinator here at the Denver Museum of Nature and Science. It's my honor to welcome you here tonight for a virtual Indigenous film showing uh, brought to us uh, by the wonderful folks that you see in, in one of the boxes uh, or that you're about to see on your screen, uh, Jean Rubin and Merv Tano. I am so excited to uh, enjoy this film with all of you. We also have some special guests in, uh, in our midst today, uh, folks involved with the making and uh, performance and creation of this film. So I will go ahead and hand this over to Jean Rubin. Thanks, Austin. Thank you, uh, everyone, for joining us. It's great to see people from uh, all reaches of the world here, all reaches of the globe. Um, tonight is the, the final screening of our 20th annual Indigenous Film and Arts Festival, which is presented by the International Institute for Indigenous Resource Management. Uh, with me is Merv Tano, our Institute President. Um, We lost you there for a moment, Jean. I'm going to interrupt because I think we may have muted for just a second there. Okay. Okay. Um, we, we just introduced Merv, so we can pick up from. Oh, so we'll pick up with thanking um, our sponsors. You you uh, saw the sponsor logos and community partner logos scrolling on the screen as you logged in. Uh, I would like to mention a few of them. Our premier sponsor for this year's festival is the National Endowment for the Arts. Our presenting sponsors our Colorado Creative Industries and Kanika Minolta. Our associate sponsors are the Colorado Office of Film, Television and Media, the Canadian Consulate in Denver, and AARP Colorado. Uh, on the community partners uh, screen, you saw organizations such as the Denver Museum of Nature and Science uh, that provides uh, both theater venues and also this wonderful virtual platform that lets us reach folks in Canada and Aotearoa and bring in speakers from Aotearoa. So uh, a wonderful a platform from the museum. Uh, I have a, a, a couple of special thank yous uh, to Maury Love, who is founder of one of our sp sponsors, Raukua, excuse me, Raukua Consultants. Uh, Maury is also on our Institute Board of Directors and is in the chat room tonight. Uh, also to Niu Li'i Foundation and Kumu Lao Foundation, uh, all of all three partners who helps uh, support our Hawaiian and Pacific Islander programs. This year's festival theme is the good life, which means different things to different people. And each of our films this year has spoken to that theme in one manner or another. Tonight's film is A Boy Called Piano, the story of John Fa Famoana Luafutu. You might think it's odd that a film that document, documents a man's journey through state care, prison, gang membership, and the impacts of those experiences on his identity and his family could illustrate the good life. But another part of the story is about relationships with family, with community about finding a good life after prison and about breaking the intergenerational cycle of incarceration. So you'll see those stories as well. After the films, I uh, will come back and Merv will moderate a conversation um, with the folks that you're seeing on your screen. Um, Nina Nawalawalo uh, is the director of the film and sitting with her is uh, Matthias Luafutu. He is uh, John Fa'amoana's son. Uh, you will see him in the film. And also with us, uh, Catherine Wyeth, who was the, is the film producer. Uh, joining the panel is Karen Rudolph, who produced a documentary called Making the River. Some of you uh, probably saw that because uh, at one of our festivals because we screened it a number of years ago. It deals with many of the same films that you'll see in tonight's film. Uh, so we wanted to bring Karen into the conversation because some of these issues are um, are uh, similar from uh, among indigenous communities really around the globe. 
Uh, the film runs 57 minutes. Uh, when the film is over, we'll come back and we'll bring all of our speakers on and Merv will start the conversation. So let's roll. All right, thank you so much, everyone. We're going to hand this back over to Jean and Merv for our discussion this evening. Thank you so much for your time. And uh, please, if you have any questions, just raise them in the chat. Okay. Uh, wow, powerful film. So Merv, I'm gonna just turn the mic over to you to start our conversation and just remind folks, you know, we'll be, um, we'll be taking questions uh, inter intermittently through the, through the conversation. So post your questions at any time. Yeah, thank you, Eugene. I love this film uh, it's on, on so many levels. Uh, uh, it's uh, from a kind of a, a Hawaiian eye uh, perspective. There's, there's, uh, there's so much of it that resonates with with me. Uh, that opening uh, scene. At the, at the commission hearing, when he speaks of taro and snow, I mean, for someone from uh, uh, from Hawaii, that is a, a very significant uh, uh, statement. Uh, and so, if if you could address that, but also in the context, you can start with uh, Matthias. Uh, there's so many of these kind of cultural elements uh, uh, that are throughout uh, the, uh, the film. And one of the things that happens uh, in many instances uh, is that for a lot of in indigenous uh, uh, folks who are caught up in the uh, in the penal system in the on the wrong side of the uh, criminal justice system uh, it's a, a, a situation where that becomes sort of the first opportunity they have to to get close to their culture because they're uh, as, as part of the process of uh, rehabilitation, uh, culture is uh, an important part of it, but it, it's kind of a catch as catch can. Uh, sometimes it's there, sometimes it's not, and then sometimes when you when you leave the system, you're on your own. Uh, so the question, uh, Matthias, is how do we kind of institutionalize? that uh, culture and its role in the, uh, uh, call it the, the rehabilitation uh, process. Uh, thank you for your question, Mu. Um, um, if, um, I think for me, as you see in the film, um, for my father being incarcerated, it, it was a loss of culture for him. Um, yeah. And um, yeah. I think uh, that was the ongoing effect for him, you know, uh, it went for years until he got in touch with his culture again, I, I think, you know, um, was part a big part of his rehabilitation. I can't really answer for him, except that I do know uh, through through the making of the film that a big part of him was his disconnection to what he had come from. Um, which um, added to, you know, his, um, uh, what do you call it? Yeah, his ongoing problems uh, in a new world. Um, but for me, um, and this is generations later, and um, I think it's sort of testament to how many people were in prison um, of my ethnicity when I arrived. We're, we're dead, there was a few of them. But when I came into incarceration, we were a bit of a force. And a lot of that was that they had embraced our culture. So I came into the penal system um, uh, and uh, our, sh our culture was strong um, in there, um, whether it be uh, haka or wata or, um, 
you know, learning songs is with us and, and our um, Māori brothers that, you know, we had a, a culture group, which something my father didn't have um, in there. So I think it was more promoted um, for us when I was incarcerated that uh, a culture was a big thing and of healing. Um, and for me, I think the most poignant moment was when my nana, who is very traditional, um, came in to visit me um, when I was in prison. And um, I think that was the defining moment for me that I was never going to come back to this place. To see my nana, you know, dressed in traditional Samoan uh, uh, woman's clothing to come into a prison and to, you know, not dress me down, but just to see the pain in her eyes that, you know, it was her grandson. Know, in prison after watching her son go through prison. So yeah. I think for me, holding on to my culture was yeah, a big part of how I turned my life around as well. And I think the, the regaining of culture for my father was always in him, but for him to be okay, that it was okay to be Samoan again, you know, in this new world was a part of his redemption. Um, so yeah, culture is a big thing in there for me. Um, and it is a big thing you know, those fundamentals is what I stick to out here, how I carry myself as a Samoan, how I carry myself as a Pacific Islander, who I represent. So, yeah, in, in becoming that, it makes you change your life and make you change things that, you know, weren't, yeah, weren't helping, yeah, but the answers. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, Karen, could, could you weigh in on that question, please? Yeah, could you say the question again? I have so much to say about this movie. Yeah. <laughs> Why don't I just say that? This is like the perfect film. This is so beautiful and such great storytelling. You, you know, I mean, I was when I was watching it, I was thinking we could talk for an hour about the filmmaking and yes. how incredible it was. And then we could probably talk for a week about what it's talking about, about the story. And when G when I was asked to be on this panel, I thought, why am I being asked to be on this panel? And then when I saw the film, I thought, oh, it's because the film that my husband, I'm a widow now, but the film about my husband's life that we produced, that a Navajo woman directed, is like the North American version of this film. Only I don't think ours was as beautiful as this one was. But my husband grew up in, uh, his tribe was terminated. He grew up in foster homes, went straight into juvenile prisons, went straight into adult prisons. And when I met him, he was facing the death penalty in Walla Walla prison. And through some incredible things, he he got free and and when and we were married years later and he, and we became foster parents of native american boys um because my husband said he didn't you know he didn't want other kids to go through what he had gone through because he was raised all in white homes but um the difference is that now it we have the Indian Child Welfare Act that gives tribes, native tribes, control over their children. You know, so, um, and and what I see in my husband's, he's a Muckleshoot, one of his tribes, is our nephews, who are now adult men, who are fathers, they got into trouble as young men, as teenagers, but the tribe had the resources and the political power to instead of those kids going to state prisons, they were they were dealt with. The tribe had their own justice system and their own rehabilitation. And those two young men now are traditional carvers, you know, up in the Northwest, totem poles and cedar, and they make they make their living that way. The tribe is able to support them doing that, and they're able to. I mean, and that healed them, you know? And so I see, you know, I wanted to say, you know, there's um, there's hope, you know, there's hope. 
but it's definitely what you were saying, Matthias, about, about, you know, you're inside, you're in the joint, but your culture is there and is being honored and the, and the young men who are raised outside of their culture learn it. it anyway. So thank you so much for making this film. It's just amazing. I live next door to East Palo Alto, which has this huge uh, Pacific Islander community. You know, it's like a third of the population is. I would love for this film to be shown there. Thank you. I'll be quiet now. I, I just need to interject something here. Um, for the filmmakers of A Boy Called Piano, when Karen says it's the perfect film, that is high praise indeed. When she, when, when her film was submitted, it came in after our submission deadline and the entire festival was programmed. And if I get a five minute film, you know, we can, we can squeeze in a short film. Her film is 90 minutes. And I looked, I said, there's no way, but I'm going to, obviously I'm going to watch this film. And we were so floored by the, the power of her film. We added a day to the festival just so we could screen her film. It was the longest festival we ever had. So her perfect, she, she made a perfect film also. And, and for folks in the audience, uh, the, um, the website that's posted in the chat, that makingtheriver.com is, uh, you can go there, you can um, see more about, you know, Karen and Jimmy, but you can also stream the film. For free, yeah. yeah. And the other, the other website, um, uh, we wanted to jump right into conversation, but you can get more background information on Catherine and Nina and Matthias on uh, their website, the theconch.com as well. Okay, back to you. Okay, um, just a quick for for Nina and Catherine, if you all want to weigh in on that. Uh, as well, uh, please do. But but Nina, I, I gotta say, uh, <laughs> there's so much. There, there's a couple of shots in in that in that film, a couple of sequences. This is oh my, you know, that's 400 blows. Uh, and I'm wondering if that is that is just my uh, imagination, or uh, was there something? Uh, kind of a uh, Truffaut uh, uh, inspired by your uh, uh, your direction. Oh, well, we sampled Naka, and um, thank you so much for your question. Yeah, I think um, you know we were sort of asking ourselves because it was a play, course, and it began as a theatre play, and um, and when COVID happened, we got you know the opportunity to translate it first into a a radio play for Radio New Zealand. And so um, we had to sort of think, how do we tell the story for the ear? And then, you know, we were able to then go forth and make the documentary. And I suppose we used um, key scenes because, of course, we we sort of thought, how do we go on this journey? How do I ask Fat Moana to, you know, go back to the boy's home, which is, of course, you know, one of the darkest places in his life. And so... Mm -hmm. We had to be quite nimble with the way we were sort of thinking, how do we capture and shoot it? And I think, you know, the, the, one of the key departure points was uh, for for Māori and Pacific children when they're incarcerated, you know, they can't feel the ocean, can't feel the wind, they can't feel all of the things that connect them to their souls and their spirituality in the community. So we... We sort of chose, you know, it was very specific to use the water and underwater and the things that are linked to our legends and, um, and myths. And then we looked at the theme of pathways. What pathway do we take in life? Is it a prison corridor? Is it a, um, you know, a pathway to the ocean, the pier in Christchurch, which is where the Luafutus are based? So... Um, and then, and then, sort of shooting the scenes in the cell, which is, and trying to get that feeling of isolation. So, we sort of chose um, specific things that we felt, you know, will speak to an audience of concrete and then nature. And I think, actually, you know, taking the film into the world and taking it to Finland with the Sami people, 
going to Canada, the First Nation. Um, you know, our our natural, our, our oceans and our earth and our land are us. And so when you remove children from that, um, you know, we, we can, you know, and so we sort of use these mm. things in the way to um, to tell it. And, and I suppose because we are theatre makers, we were trying to translate the layering um, in the way that I believe you need the visual landscape, you know, with storytelling. Mm. Yeah, it, it was, I, I thought just on one hand, very beautifully done and, and very powerfully done as well. This notion of, of place, the centrality of place, uh, it, 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 <clears throat> the, the film, I think, uh, really, uh, you know, demonstrates, uh, if you will, like, uh, the Taranga Wai uh, just perfectly. So thank you for that. Cultural um, objects. Oh, um, yeah, uh, also, I'll just add to what Nina said is um, uh, there are a lot of cultural elements added to um, uh, a lot of the scenes, like the red necklace, which is a ulufala. Um, it, it, it is, uh, you know, it's a, it's a cheaply thing to, to wear. And um, I think uh, uh, Nina's vision of using that um, for our own people, it's something that they could identify with strongly. And, the, you know, we come from a line of chiefs, our family, to, you know, when we came, uh, my father and my grandparents gr migrated here to be taken through that system after, you know, from our rich history, and I think there was a, a way of Nina expressing it, the regaining back our culture through the symbolic um, themes of the Ulufala of um, my dad's pe'a, which is a rite of passage, which is the tattoos on his legs, and, you know, it's... Uh, those things um, sort of relate to your first question, how strong is culture within us? Um, uh, it is everything for us. It is, you know, how we live and breathe. It's just how do we make it work in this world that we're in? So, um, yeah, I don't have to add it on, but there's also feathers that represent the children. Um, uh, uh, there's so much spirits, you know. Um, a lot of it, uh, what I love about the film when I first saw it was, you know, my identification to things culturally in me um, um, and, and reminded me of, you know, my own journey through that's really my, my, my foundation and what have got, what it's gotten me through the hardest times I've had to face. One of the uh, challenges, I think, uh, <clears throat> with the, uh, with film, uh, and especially a film on, on, on this subject, uh, where, where you have this kind of uh, uh, intergenerational chain. Uh, the, the, the breaking of that chain is, is sometimes very disruptive to family cohesion, uh, etc. Uh, can you speak about the, the challenges of uh, being part of that chain and say, you know, figuring out how we're going to break it? I mean, you know, your, uh, your Nana shows up and there was that uh, moment you said, this is, this is it for me. And I imagine you say, and forevermore with the entire family. But how does that process work yeah. out, you know, in, in kind of practical terms? Oh, practically, I think um, it takes one to get the ball rolling in your family. Um, and I think, you know, uh, what an unsaid thing in film, besides my, my nana being a strong um, theme of the woman in our family, um, my mum, was the glue, uh, held us all together, um, as broken as we were. Um, so for her, she was the first one to say, you know, that's enough uh, of this sort of life. So she she uh, went to rehab and um, sorted, you know, problems out for herself. My father followed suit. 
And um, so, I mean, it takes one to get the ball rolling, even though I continued on in my path, see them set that example to know that they'd made those changes. I had something to come back to. So for me, it was like, you know, I had to keep falling over. Um, and I had to, you know, as all, all kids, you have to go back to your parents. And when you have parents that have, you know, rehabilitated themselves um, and are able to answer the questions you have uh, rather than sending you off to, you know, a program or something, um, that was so valuable for me. So um, all kudos to my mother um, for being the glue for, you know, their, her love for my father through thick and thin. Um, that my father followed suit, and and for me it was a no-brainer. You know, if I wanted to get out of this mess, my parents had already set the example after walking through the fire. And I think you know, um, with the film, with um, my mum being the centerpiece, of course, it, it wouldn't have been the film it was if Nina wasn't at the helm. You know, um, a woman telling a man's story. Um, uh, it, it just translated differently to you know what I thought it would be. So you know, um, yeah. Uh, uh, as always, you know, it's our mothers, it's the women out in our lives that it, we wouldn't be here without. So yeah, I, I put it back to that. Yeah. yeah. yeah we just uh, th this uh, past Sunday uh, saw a performance. Uh, of uh, a Maori uh, uh, dance troupe, uh, the performance was Mana Wahine. Mm. So, <laughs> and that's what you're talking about with with the the, the Wahine in in your uh, your family. Powerful, powerful, <laughs> powerful ladies. <laughs> so uh, we don't have uh, questions yet, but we have a couple of comments that that I'll read for for folks. Um, this one, I'm a caseworker, and I'm very glad Karen has brought up ICWA, Indian Child Welfare Act. I shared this event with my county's entire HHS because I felt this film is so important and relevant to understanding the impacts of our work. And then um, oh, this is uh, from our, the, looks like a, is this our same person? Uh, beautiful film, much needed conversation Next week, I will be sharing this experience with the men in the Seventh Step Self Betterment Club, the Native American Social and Cultural Awareness Club, as well as their Circle of Concerned Lifers Club inside the Nebraska State Penitentiary. Thank you. Um, we're actually, I was personally I, hoping that um, this film and, and, and Making the River, that Karen's film, could, could actually uh, be shown to. Uh, to, to prison inmates, right. uh, because it's uh, it's powerful, and I think it you know it shows you life after the inhumanity of that incarceration. The, the images of the cells, you know, you you have oh some God. shots of a grown man who he has to position himself right in the center in order to stand up straight, and he can touch both walls standing there. I mean, the inhumanity of that sort of incarceration is just, it's hard to fathom. And, you know, you see that we see, Matthias, we see your father on screen. And Karen, you know, you and Jimmy came to the festival to present the film and you were here for, for quite a few days and we had a lot of opportunity to interact with you and Jimmy. And my sense of both of these men is just such wonderful people, people you would, you would want to know. You know, I always say to Merv, my, my benchmark for, for people is what I want to leave my kids with this person for a day. <laughs> and, and yes, I would leave my kids with, with us, with your father and with Jimmy, these wonderful people. Um, <clears throat> I just want to touch on uh, the cells. Um, the, 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 that cell I actually spent time in um, uh, will be filmed. Um, it was Addington Prison when I was 17. Um, uh, and yeah, we only had a bucket. We only had a bucket uh, for a toilet and um, and two men cell. Two beds would be in that cell. Mm -hmm. So um, that, that, that was my first experience of being incarcerated at 17 was the exact same cell. They opened it up for us and we were lucky enough for us to film there. So 
me, my father, my uncles have all spent time in that prison. Um, uh, and uh, by the grace of the old gods, um, yeah, none of us have visited it again. So. And I, Matthias, I didn't mean to leave you out. You could, you could, I'm happy to have you babysit. Wouldn't be kids now, but we're, <laughs> we're up to grandkids, but you could babysit my grandkids. <laughs> and called the baby whisperer in our family i put all, all our babies to sleep you know by the rock i think it's the height yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay yeah i've been reading through it uh so uh maury love um uh, has posted a, a comment maury um as i mentioned earlier is um on our board of directors thank you all for this film just a comment as a maori not from the Poro Fenua, but close of interest is that many of these places have Maori names of, sig of significant, oops, this is scrolling away, uh, uh, significant in Maori terms. The Royal Commission, as I saw, was harrowing, and my hope is that it will change things. Could you comment? Be there were some changes, right? I know that there were some recommendations that came out of the, those hearings, but have you actually seen any um, real change? Oh, thanks for the question. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Um, you know, no, Whāna was the first um, Pacific Island man to um, tell his story in, in the Pacific hearings. Um, sorry, what was the question? Um, it was to do with change, yes. And right. so um, what was wonderful was that the Royal Commission used the film to go and speak to survivors and show the film to draw out other survivors. You know, it's a very taboo subject. Um, you know, families back in the day, they don't want their names, you know, they don't want the family name to be known, with children in the boys' homes. And, um, you know, the sort of thing of coming forward and, and, and speaking is, um, is something that is you know, it can be taboo as well. And so the film was a very good breakthrough for Whapmoana and then used in that way to, um, to, as a resource in a way, to draw other people to come forward. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, well, I think I never knew about my father's history here, so it was all new until we started creating the film, which um, explained a lot to me of the way he was, which brought a lot of healing. Um, as for changes, um, yeah, well, there's going to be a lot of recommendations made and um, there's a big, big hikoi, which is a march um, coming up soon, um, uh, where these signatures will be um, presented, presented to the, to the government. And, um, and so through the sort of hearing, they have, they've set up a survivor group and so there is a, there is a coming together in a few weeks of, um, I suppose, survivors working with the Royal Commission to um, to take it all to Parliament. So um, we've also had a change of government, of course, since it all started. So yeah. it's a very interesting time of change. And, um, yeah, I mean, for us, you know, being able to take it into the boys' homes, which we did yesterday, is, um, is, is a positive step forward with the government of um, them still being open to listening to the survivor voice in that sense and you know ultimately you know they're looking for an apology of you know an apology so um but one is very much you know in that space leading it which is um you know incredible incredibly brave very you know so much courage and um to tell his truth yeah it's a privilege for all of us to um walk alongside him one of the things your dad said, Matthias, was uh, was talking about uh, the uh, uh, the talents of the the inmates. They're they're uh, the carvers, they're uh, uh, musicians, uh, etc. Et, et um, but they they don't have that kind of uh, opportunity uh, to. Uh, uh, to build on those on those talents on those skills uh, because you know as we were speaking earlier uh, it, the fact that your dad was assigned to the library was 
in a sense, just extremely fortuitous. Uh, because surrounded by books, he reads the book by Al Wen, and then has the therapist said, well, write them. Holy smokes. I mean, that is so kind of uh, arbitrary and capricious and so blessed. Uh, uh, and, uh, from kind of a, a societal uh, uh, perspective, that was great. But how do you how do you kind of institutionalize that stuff? How do you get these kinds of institutions to uh, build on the, the skills, the talents of the folks that are there? To even recognize them. Well, yeah, 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 yeah. The this, this, this statement in the film, they don't even recognize them. Exactly, those right. Um, I, I think things have, have changed a lot a lot now um, since my dad was incarcerated, where there are a lot more programs in that, um, uh, especially for our, um, our Indigenous people in there. Not enough, in, in my point of view, but there is a lot more than what my dad had. Um, uh, for my dad, I think he was trying to hide the fact that he was you known Samoan uh, and stuff in there. It was, you know, he was a real minority, but we hear this um, now these days, yeah, there are a lot more programs, there's a lot more help. Um, uh, visiting the boys' home in Rotorua, the facilities and, uh, you know, the options they have now um, go a long way to, um, yeah, a, a better way of rehabilitating, you know, from young. But when you when I was in corrective training, um, it was just really, yeah, PT-type military boot camp. Um, there was no opportunity to, you know, uh, better yourself or, or to have a look in yourself. It was just, you know, yeah, play the game. But I, I feel now, um, um, yeah, I, I'm seeing a lot more positive programs and that, especially for our own. Um, uh, there's a lot more of our own in, as carers um, and, and can really, the boys can really sort of relate to more. Um, so, yeah, I hope that answers your question. So, yeah. Well, that's that's good to hear. Yeah. So, Karen, I, re I recall in uh, in making the river, uh, Jimmy said it was in prison was the first time he really could connect with his his Indian identity. There was an, a tribal elder who would come in and, and they would do uh, he would do sweats with the, with the inmates. Can you talk a little bit about that and and, and you know yeah. since, oh. what's it like? You know, since Jimmy you know, was a uh, a native young man who uh, in Oregon, which at that point and still now is mostly a white state. And um, and he grew up in foster homes. He did not know what tribe he was from. You know, he obviously was native, he looks totally native, but he didn't know what tribe. And he walked into Oregon State Penitentiary and you know how it is in prison that, it's very racially segregated. And the native, older native men came up to him when he came in as a fish and said, you know, you know, what's your name? Who's your father? Jimmy had not been raised by his family, but he knew his father's name. His father had been the last tribal chair of the tribe. And these older men had known his father. And so they they educated him as to who his people were. And they, like you said, they had a club. They had, because of the uh, American Indian Religious Freedom Act, uh, the, uh, instead of just having Catholic priests and a Protestant priest, they let um, Native spiritual leaders into to work with the, the Native brothers. Yeah, and that's where he first started learning about his culture, which became, you know, the meaning of his life. Yeah, um, we, we have two comments that are, that are very related, so I'll read both of these. I found particularly powerful a statement early in the film that there is a hurt little boy 
child inside all these men. And then the next comment, uh, in the film, they talked about the, the baby inside of us and the anger that built up. Can you speak to that, how you address the baby, how you expel that anger? Um, I can speak to that because um, it's something that, because uh, I went to the same rehabilitation rehab um, that my father went to when I decided that, you know, I'd sort my life out. And uh, we had this thing called psychodrama which is, you know, you reenact some trauma from your life and get to revisit it. Um, wow. Part of my rehabilitation was revisiting the boy that I had abandoned, you know, to do whatever I needed to do as the adult um, to get myself through trauma that I'd forgotten about the young boy that was originally hurt. So I think in reference... That's what my dad means is, you know, there's a hurt child within within us. And um, unless you go back to that child and say, hey, um, you're, it's all right now, you know, I'm sorry I abandoned you. Um, so, you know, it's taking ownership of, of yourself or, or your own past traumas. For me, that's what, what it's about. So uh, waking up the baby. My father used to say that, you know, um, it's a threat, you know, don't make me wake up the baby boys, you know, when we, we misbehave, me and my brothers. So, um, uh, uh, I, I realised that it must have come from a bigger thing when he was in prison. But, yeah, visiting the abandoned child, the hurt child, when you've gone through those things as a kid um, and, and going back as the adult and, and forgiving, you know, allowing the child to forgive the adult is, is a part of your rehabilitation and way of, you know, getting standing back up. Uh, there was an earlier question I think that Austin asked about the symbolism of the oh, of the water. Uh, I, you know I think um, of right. the underwater shots. I think you, you touched on on the water, but let me go because it was so poetically asked. <laughs> the phrasing was lovely. Um, let me find that. Oh, where did it go? Here we go. Uh, so this is from Austin. I love the underwater shots in this. I would love to know about the deeper connection to these choices to use those as a setting. Uh, oh, thanks for the question. Um, I, mean, I think, um, you know, of course, the monologue, um, which is the opening speech in the play, Fat Moana wrote about we all begin in innocence, a blank page. Um, you know, the 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 idea of the womb and um, and every, you know the word and so that was one of the very first sort of visual or the the sort of thing of if we think how do we explore innocence and how do we um, capture that and so um, I think that was that was one of the very very beginning things of having the, the very subtle heartbeat in the very beginning that sits um sits and sits underneath that monologue but also you know for us as pacific island people as maori people there are many many uh, you know the water the water for us is, is spiritual it's for all indigenous cultures what the water or the river mean to us um and so um i suppose you know for tane which is matthias's son which is but moana's grandson what is so, so unique about him is he is he's sa half Samoan and he's half Māori. And so um, him playing and exploring the character of Wheels, Wheels was the, one of the boys that was in the boys' home with Whatmoana. He's from an area called Wotorua, where, and, um, and the children there with the penny diving and diving into the water, um, you know, we started to look at all the ways that um, all of the scenes that connect us to uh, to our to ourselves, to our culture, and so I sort of explored it in a number of ways. I started very much with the feeling of the womb, and all of us as human beings and children and growing within our mothers. You know, um, I used it specifically for Fakarewarewa because that is where. Uh, wheels was as a child with the penny diving and um, and I used it in a way to do with I suppose the anger and the sort of thing of the warrior so that's why with Tane when he's 
talking about being in isolation and and you have to think about that don't you when when you're in your darkest moments when children are just locked up where do they go to in their minds they go to the safest place that they can and i suppose four wheels it was being a child it was being within freedom it's in the water it's in the ocean so um, I sort of tried to suggest a number of things. I think also for Fatmoana, um, which he described when we were driving down the beach, is that, you know, the water is what is between Aotearoa and Samoa. Mm. The water is what is between us all and connects us. So, um, so there's sort of many, many things. Many times I tried to sort of link that in a sense. I think also, um, you know, using the feathers as a through line, it's quite subtle, but some people pick up on that, that they are the memory of um, of all the children that have gone. Which is one of the things for Fatmoana It's so important is that, you know, this denying that it even happened and all of the all of the government process, you know, a lot of the survivors just go, oh, what, are you waiting for us all to die off? And are you dragging it out so that we don't have to look at compensation so we can sort of forget it happened? So... Well, Fat Moana, there's so many men that, uh, you know, he was saying that uh, drug addicts, you know, in prison, all sorts of things, that never found their way out. The sort of, the feathers are the um, spirits in a way. And so this thing of from the river to the sea, you know, to the ocean. And mm. so, um, yeah, it's I sort of, we, you know, trying to use it in a in, in many number of ways, but... It speak, you know, it speaks to us as Pacific people, um, you know, spiritually. Yeah, I think as Polynesians, um, you know, water, the ocean, they're our highways. It's how we connect to each other, um, um, and I'm sure that's you know, with all Indigenous cultures, how it resonates with us all. Wherever we've screened the film, that water, yeah, is what connects us. It's um, yeah, that part of the elements, the earth elements. So yeah, I, I really love that. That's what strikes out in the film for me is my relationship with water and what it means to me as a Samoan, as a Pacific Islander. Yeah, it's what frees us to travel, to navigate. So we have a, um, another question in the chat here. It says, uh, the stripping of culture, of identity, seemed to be an underlying theme in the trauma that is inflicted during and perhaps before incarceration. So this is for both Matthias and Karen. Do you agree? Why do you think that affects us as humans so much? What more can be done before incarceration to help individuals connect with their culture? I agree. <laughs> Would you like to speak to that, Karen? I, I just think that um, I, I don't know if it's from, well, you know, for Jimmy and, and my sons, um, you know, we live in a racist society. And, and, um, and so the message is that they're less than, you know, that, that um, and I think the, the armor the protection against that is being strongly connected to culture, to their culture, because it tells them something different than what, you know, what my culture tells them about themselves. Plus, it's just beautiful. Did you want to? I have. Uh... I don't know if this is the last question, but the scenes uh, by the uh, uh, the chain link uh, fence that surrounds the old, uh, I guess the old uh, uh, prison. Uh, it starts off with Fa'amona and then Matthias and then Tani, who's your son. Yes. But then Tani goes first, and then at least, and then you do, and then finally your dad does. I don't know why, but that 
I, I found that scene very powerful. Uh, and I don't know what you all as producer or, or, or director had in mind when you uh, uh, when you set that uh, scene up. Well, I don't want to uh, talk about my interpretation of it, but but I thought it was doggone powerful. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I think um, that sort of thing of release, you know, and what is beautiful is Tane breaking that cycle and not having gone into the system and, you know, placing it right there at the, at the fence where, you know, Whatmwana was on the inside, where Matthias stands there and was on the inside. Um, you know, that generational um, breaking of that and empowering yourself to kind of walk away from the system. Walk, I, we, you know, we walk away in that sense. So, you know, um, it's, you know, some of the things were sort of like the same thing, a departure point, rather than the pathway into the prison. It's, you know, how it, the pathway away in that sense. Yeah, do you yeah. want to? Um... Yeah, I, I, I agree with um, uh, Nina, his sentiments. Um, uh, there's all sorts of things every time I watch the film that pop out for me. And I was actually watching that scene closely this time. And um, I think for me, it's, Letting my son take lead, you know, um, you eventually pass ownership, you know, to your son. And so I, I think for me, uh, I looked at it like my father's passing me the mantle to 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 pick up from where he's left off. And um, uh, yeah, I was just thinking about that scene and like, yeah, you know, my son's going to lead the way into the future. Right. right. So yeah, um, it's a great question you brought that up because I didn't think of it in that way. I thought of it along the lines of Nina, we were creating like, you know, it's a departure from there, but then it's sort of looking towards the future. Yes. My, son, my daughter's the, 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 the next phase of the future for us. So, yeah. That's exactly how I saw it, you know, it was, this, the child shall lead them. <laughs> <laughs> like the truth sets us, it's so biblical. Thank you. <laughs> So, all right, so we're, we're getting close to the end of our program. Uh, Austin posted one, uh, we'll make this our last question, uh, for Catherine. Uh, he says, the, the conch is taking on these incredible performances and pieces. Can you speak to the mission there and how folks can connect with you further or support these kinds of pieces? Uh, Nisa Bulavanaka, uh, thank you so much for the question, Austin. And um, firstly, I just want to say on behalf of Nina and the Conch team and Fatamwana and Matthias and the Luafutu Ayanga, thank you so much for having us, uh, Jean and Mervyn, in your festival, the Indigenous um, Film and Arts Festival in Colorado. It's such an honor to be here and an honor to be part of this conversation and I want to pay tribute to the traditional custodians of the land in Denver, Colorado and also the traditional custodians of the land here in Aotearoa in New Zealand where, where we are. Um, the, the conch has been you know a powerhouse in terms of creating a platform for Pacific stories around the world for 20 years and um, over 20 years and I've been very privileged to be part of that journey for the last five years. So I've been an integral part of the team of bringing a boy called Piano um, story, you know, out into the world and to audiences around the world. And it's been a huge privilege for me to, to be part of that. And of course, you know, we are, um, we're continuing, everything The Conch does is about social advocacy. So we, we've made, having made this beautiful film, um, we're now using it as a resource to try to empower and advocate for survivor communities. So we're taking the film into prisons around the world. We're taking the film into youth justice residences around the world, and we want to continue with that work. So we're still going to, the book Piano will continue to work in that way for a long time. But we are, of course, always also developing new creative projects. Uh, we have two projects in development at the moment, which I'm really excited about. Um, and yes, there's, of course, there's, we'd love to connect with audiences, with um, anyone who, you know, the work speaks to. You can connect with The Conch through our website. There's an inquiry form on the website, which is www.theconch.co.nz. Um, you can reach out to Jean and Mervyn at the Institute, and they can put you in touch with myself and Nina directly as well, if you have 
any further kind of more involved questions or conversation you want to have, we'd really love to hear from you. And um, yes, thank you so much for having us. So, um, Karen, you're still active, you know, in, in uh, prisoners' rights issues. Yeah. So I'll, I'll, I'll toss it to you if there's any um, particular organizations you're working with you'd like to mention and any, if you have any, any last thoughts you'd like to share before we sign off. Yeah, I, I am friends with, I, I'm on the board of Prison Radio, but the, the group that I think this would love to see this film is a group in Oakland, California called Courage, C-U-R-Y-G, you know, different spelling, that works with indigenous uh, youth who are in the, in the prison system and, and getting out of that system and and um yeah showing them a better way or a new way but addressing you know what they've have faced being um indigenous youth so i'm going to be in touch with you because i think they would love to show this film yeah. oakland has a large indigenous community well, that's a, we would love to we would love to share the film you know, it's an interesting thing, isn't it? Fatmoana being a living man. It's not sort of, oh, it's a film and it goes on the rounds and then you put it down. It's, it's you know, it's a living conversation. And so, um, you know, we, of course, we have taken it into a lot of platforms, but this sort of thing of connecting like this with you, Karen, and I just can't wait to see your film. Yeah. I just, <laughs> we would love to this idea that we could put them together or we yeah, could. And a bookend. Yeah. Mm, absolutely on for that. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Matthias, your son's going to be so happy 20 years from now that, that you all made this film. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it, Karen. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Thank you very much. All to our panelists, uh, to the audience, to the museum, to the museum for hosting. Um, I love this stuff. Yeah. Um, I really do. I'm watching my clock is 8.29 and Austin said we have to be finished by 8.30. Uh, 8.30. Okay. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you. That's, you. That's, that's okay. I can be the, I can be the bad guy uh, at, and, and do that. So thank you everyone so much for joining us. If you're interested in further programming here at the Denver Muse Museum of Nature and Science, uh, dmns.org is the best way to reach out and get in touch with us. We've got Indigenous film several more times this year and we would love to see folks here. Uh, at the museum as much as possible. And uh, thank you again to everyone that joined us. And um, if you're in Colorado, stay safe from the snow. And yeah, if you you're not there, the us, <laughs> <I hope laughs> safe. thanks everyone for joining us. So